Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Impact Investing in the Arts, Staying Out of Trouble or Missing the Boat. This is the eighth of a series of webinars designed to build the capacity of Canadian consultants working in the arts and culture sector as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Sue Edworthy. I'm a member of the Volunteer Board of Directors of Arts Consultants Canada. Before we begin, we wish to recognize that the members of Arts Consultants Canada are honored to live and work on the traditional territory of the First Nation, Inuit, and Métis peoples from coast to coast to coast, whose presence here reaches back to time immemorial. We acknowledge the historical oppression of their lands and cultures in what we now know as Canada, and fervently believe the arts contribute to the healing and decolonizing journey we all share together. We honor their long history of welcoming many other peoples to this beautiful territory. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work here. I am zooming in from Toronto or to Toronto, and the land I am on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credits, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. I also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by the Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. For those who do not know, Arts Consultants Canada is the National Association of Professional Consultants Working in the Arts. For the past 17 years, we have served as a community of practice for individual consultants who work to support Canada's arts and culture sector by providing services to members and clients across the country. Our membership adheres to a professional code of conduct, and our programs include professional development activities such as these, mentorship, podcasts, and networking, online and in person. Thank you, Canadian Heritage, for supporting this series. The members of our programming committee, Maurizio and Jennifer, and all of you who chose to submit questions in advance. Our Zoom protocol today, we will be using Q&A, not the chat. We are recording for availability later on the website, and we are providing captioning for those who wish it, which you can find on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. You will also find the captioning button on the toolbar. To introduce the panel, I will pass you over to our board chair, Victoria Steele. Good day, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. I'm uh, coming to you from Algonquin Anishinaabe Territory, otherwise known as uh, Ottawa Beautiful Downtown Ottawa Gapno. Um, I have to say how incredibly excited I am by today's topic. I, maybe that's just because I'm a I'm a finance junkie of a of a sort. But um, I've been very, very curious about impact investing ever since I first learned about it a number of years ago from our uh, community foundation here in Ottawa, because it's really having an important impact on the nonprofit sector. And yet we don't know that much about it in the cultural sector. Uh, so I'm really delighted um, to introduce today's panel. Um, just a quick preamble. Again, you know, coming out of the pandemic, we've the cultural sector and others are facing a lot of challenges in terms of organizational capacity, our capital, and of course, all the revenue streams are changing. They're changing every year. Uh, so we need to be creative. And in impact investing or otherwise known as social finance is, can be a really creative way for solutions. So what a fantastic group we have to talk about this. Um, First, I want to um, introduce you to the moderator of today's uh, discussion and actually the person who suggested this. Uh, and this is none other than uh, David Maggs, who is a fellow in on Arts and Society at the Metcalf Foundation. And want to say thank you to the Metcalf Foundation for their support, uh, helping us to uh, enable this session to happen. And go merci, David. This is uh, wonderful to have you. Um, I don't know how many of you are great followers of David Meggs, but certainly I am. Uh, as soon as I discovered his his discussion piece on arts and the world after this, um, David carries on an active career as an interdisciplinary artist and researcher focused on the arts, climate change, and sustainability. He is a founder and pianist of Dark by Five, has written works for the stage, collaborated on augmented and virtual reality, works that have been included in the UK's Future of Live Performance Spotlight Gallery. David is Artistic Director of the Rural Canadian Inter-Arts Organization, Camber Arts, uh, and Founder and Co-Director of the uh, Youth Training Academy, the, the Graham Academy. Uh, you know, David is such an interesting individual, um, but he's not the only one here. 
Allow me to say a couple more things about David, though. He initiated and co-produced the CBC Dark Channel film The Country, exploring the Canadian government's handling of Indigenous identity in Newfoundland. And when he was with the uh, Monk School of Global Affairs, he co-authored co-authored sustainability in an imaginary world with a with longtime collaborator John Robinson, looking at the relationship between art and sustainability. So it's really been somebody who's been leading a lot of the conversation on uh, culture and climate change. And after the publication of Art and the World, and this became he joined the Metcalf Foundation to really help continue this conversation. And now he's co-leading the development of a report on the UK Innovation Foundation, NESTA's a groundbreaking work on impact investing. So thank you, David, for bringing this to us. Um, our, our next guest is Sean. Uh, we're not 100% sure if we're going to get your last name correct. So I, I can uh, jump in on that. <laughs> My last name is Gobi. Just ignore all the letters in it and then you can pronounce it properly. Thank you, because we were... <laughs> okay, so Sean Gobi is an assistant professor in social innovation and social entrepreneurship in the School of Environment, Enterprise, and Development at the University of Waterloo. He is academic director of the Masters of Economic Development and co-director of their um, Waterloo Institute for Social Innovation and Resilience. And we actually have a very active group on social enterprise and social innovation here in Ottawa. So again, I can't wait to hear you. Um, His research supports a participatory co-design process, novel social financing tools, and basically the history or historical process of, of social innovation. So he's leading a research team supporting Canada's Social Finance Fund Investment Readiness Program. So he's really helping all of us uh, to learn about social finance across the country. So big thank you to Sean. And uh, last but far from, from, from Lee, least is our friend Raji. Um, who is a managing partner with Relay Ventures, an early stage venture capital firm with over 700 million of assets under management. This is a guy who knows about money, okay? Urban is an entrepreneur, um, an executive chair of the Canadian startup Mob Squad, whose mission is to ensure high caliber technology talent from around the world can build lives and careers within Canada. So wonderful work that you're doing, Fawn, but... He is not just an entrepreneur. He is very engaged in his community. And when I looked through his biography, I thought, well, it's hard to know where to start. So I'm going to pull out the remarkable things that Irfan is doing to help contribute to the cultural sector in Canada. He is uh, currently volunteering as co-chair of the $175 million Glenbow Reimagined Capital Campaign. He is a board member of Business and the Arts a board member of the wonderful Aga Khan Museum, and a member of the Canada Council for the Arts uh, Board. Um, He's also, amongst other things, on the National Advisory Committee of the Walrus, one of my absolute favorite magazines. Um, So I I just want to say how delighted we are at Arts Consultants Canada uh, to have you with us for this really important conversation today. And I'm going to hand this over to you, Mr. Max. Thank you, Victoria. That's very, very generous in terms of your introductions. Uh, And thanks to Arts Consultants Canada for the generous welcome, but also for indulging uh, today's topic. This, as as we might uh, think, it maybe came out of a little bit of left field for a lot of people that impact investing is not a, a, a strong theme inside cultural strategy conversations right now. Uh, however, that might be about to change, and so we felt like this might be a good time to to check in with some folks that really understand this issue thoroughly. Um, in, impact investing might be something that we're going to be learning a lot more about. And so the question of what it is and what kinds of implications it might have for Canada's cultural nonprofit sector, I thought it'd be good to jump on this uh, relatively early. I just want to be clear, my main role today will probably be in trying to keep the conversation from getting too sophisticated. I'm entirely well suited to that role inside the space of impact investing. Uh, this is new to me. I am, I am learning about this with my eyes wide open, uh, trying to understand, as the, as the sort of uh, subtitle of the gathering suggests, is this something where we're missing the boat or are we sort of wise to kind of let this opportunity pass us by? I'm very 
grateful. As you just heard, we've got two incredibly uh, thoughtful uh, leaders on this uh, topic. And so what I thought I'd do just to start off is ask them to give us a little bit of autobiography woven into some preliminary sense of uh, what impact investing is to them and, and how it relates. So Sean, perhaps if you'd start us off here, uh, if somebody says, you know, stops you at a bus stop and says, what's impact investing? Uh, how do you explain it? And, and how does your life overlap with this subject? Sure. Uh, thanks, Dave. Well, that's a, a real pleasure to be here. Um, so the first part is easy. The second part is hard. Um, the easy part is it's investing with the goal of having a social or environmental or cultural impact alongside having a financial return. That's the easy part. Uh, what it means, how it matters, what my involvement with that has been in is much more complicated. Um, so uh, uh, there's a bit of kind of background from me. Um, my professional training is I'm an economist. Um, but I'm an economist who also is very actively involved in community organizing, helping set up nonprofits, help, helping uh, social enterprises strategize, helping cultural organizations figure out their fit and strategies in, in my local community and beyond. And, um, and so uh, with that, while I was uh, doing my graduate studies, I was very, uh, uh, my early graduate studies, my master's degree, I was very interested in trying to figure out what the what the real barriers were to nonprofit organizations, charities, volunteer-based organizations in terms of having the capacity to do their work. And, um, and there's a lot of uh, really um, consistent challenges that, that that sector broadly faces, which includes a huge part of the, the cultural sector within it. Um, and a lot of them amount to, you know, being really under capacity and not just in the sense of, um, not having enough money because you know everyone says they don't have enough money. That's not something unique to arts or cultural organizations. It's more the idea that um, you know it's one thing to it's one thing to not have money to do what you'd like to do. It's another to not have the money to actually invest in things that then generate more money. Um, you know that's an investment. That's why that's why uh, uh, small businesses will will find people to invest in equity in their companies or will go to the bank to get a loan that comes in. Um, you're not, it's not a gift. It's not a grant. You have to pay it back. But the idea is that you're going to use that money to actually make yourself more productive, to have up-to-date technology, to have the right equipment, right people to, to do your job well. And consistently, the nonprofit and volunteer charitable sector has had a really hard time doing that. Um, and, uh, and and part of that has built into you know uh, uh, kind of a small c culture of these organizations. There's often not a lot of capacity to be able to do that to to manage those finances. Um, but there's a real chicken and egg thing here because also historically, mainstream financial institutions have not liked to actually provide that financing. Um, some things are illegal, like you you can't sell shares in a charity. That is a thing that will send you to jail. Don't do it. Don't try. Um, but even getting a loan is often really difficult for an organization with a social or environmental impact. Um, because, you know, think for this from the perspective of like the Royal Bank of Canada and them wanting to, you know, they might give me a loan for a house. They might give me a mortgage for my house to live in, um, which is great. But, you know, if things go bad and I don't pay them back, they're going to seize my house. That's the collateral. Um, if you're talking about giving a mortgage to the local soup kitchen that's serving the uh, homeless population, um, you know, what is RBC going to do? Are they going to seize that? Are they going to seize that as collateral? Well, probably not, because that is going to be the front page of the Globe and Mail. And it's going to cost them way more than a million dollars in business. Um, and so what their response will be is, well, we're just not going to give a loan to a soup kitchen. It's it's uncollectible collateral, so we're just not going to do it. Um, and the thing is, this is a very systemic issue in in that sector. And so, as I my kind of research career, I'm an academic. I uh, uh, do my best to speak in ways that people can understand. But you know, David's here to rein me in when I stop doing that. Um, this is what we call a systemic issue. Like this is a thing that recurs over and over and over again. And so, the social finance space, uh, impact investing, is um, in some ways is offering an out 
it's offering that these are investors who are willing to take on that risk, who want to take on that risk because they see the the they see this, you know, on the one hand as a way to produce to produce that positive social, environmental, cultural value. But on the other hand, this is also potentially an underserved market. Like maybe a lot of these institutions can actually pay these investments back. Um, they just haven't been given the opportunity. Um, so that to me was interesting. Um, so I ended up, that was the focus of my PhD research. It's been the focus of a lot of my research uh, kind of moving forward as I, as I become a professor at the University of Waterloo. It's also been the focus of a lot of my consulting work with different organizations, different social enterprises has really been focused on um, strategizing around uh, social finance and thinking where it fits in. And through that work, um, I've become really uh, tightly involved with employment and social development Canada's um, Canadian social finance fund. Um, so um, money has yet to flow through that. It's $755 million that's supposed to go into impact investing. It was announced in 2018. None of the money has actually come out of that yet, uh, but hopefully this year it will. Um, however, there has been funding that has gone as grants uh, in a program called the Investment Readiness Program to help get social purpose organizations ready to accept that funding. And so uh, we worked on them the project uh, from 2019 to 2021, which was looking at converting small business, like for-profit small businesses into social purpose organizations upon the retirement of their leaders. Um, and um, that went really well. And then when it came to the second round of the Investment Readiness Program, ESDC uh, suggested we work with the Canadian Community Economic Development Network to actually map out this space um, and evaluate it to figure out, you know, where are their barriers, where are their opportunities, how can we make recommendations moving forward? And, and we're in the midst of that right now, which is really nice because it puts us, um, you know, we really have our fingers on the pulse of where a lot of this sector is uh, coming from, where it's going, and really how the public policy piece is fitting into that. Um, so with all that to say, um, you know, that's kind of how I fit into the the space right now. Um, and and uh, just as I guess a, a word to kind of kick us off for, for you as folks who are working in the art sector, is that, you know, this social finance space is not a panacea. And there's a lot of organizations for whom going down this path is going to be a waste of time or frankly, disruptive. It could be very counterproductive. Um, but uh, for a lot of you, it's worth exploring. And I think, um, you know, like any money, it comes with strings attached. Um, if anyone has ever uh, received a grant and has had that money come in, you've got, man, that is free money. That was easy to get. and really easy to report on, and none of those things have caused anyone or organization a headache. Um, kudos for you. I have yet to see a single dollar of grant money that looks like that. Um, social financing comes with different headaches, different strings attached, um, but it's not a freebie. And uh, and really does require a lot of thinking about you know what, what the business model looks like for the organization to see whether or not it's a fit. Um, so and I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that right now and hand it off uh, uh, back to David. That's great. Thank, uh, thank you, Sean. And that, I think, opens up a lot of themes that we will come back to, uh, particularly the question of the ESDC initiative that you raised. Irfan, I was so uh, eager to have you as part of this conversation because I know you're actively involved in the cultural sector and the arts, but you sit inside, you know, what? forgive me for saying, a kind of, you know, hardcore financial perspective. You work, you know, very much. Uh, from the financial perspective on these issues, does your definition sort of vary? How would you how would you define this space and and maybe a little bit of context around some of the work that you've done relating your capacity and expertise in finance to the kind of work that you do in the cultural sector? Thank you, David, and uh, you know, thank you, Charles Consultants Canada, for the opportunity to to join you. I I love talking about this topic. It's a passion area for me. I am in finance. I've worked on Bay Street and on Wall Street. Um, but I've also had a, a fortunate career to be able to spend time in the nonprofit sector. And, you know, on social finance, this is not a new topic, but it's also extremely complicated. Like, like how you define this, like there's different ways. So if you think about like how you define it, uh, I would say historically, it's things like social impact bonds or repayable capital like loans. Um, it's 
B Corps who are investing in companies that have a social mission that's combined with a financial mission. So B Corps are companies that need to change their bylaws to say that they're unlike a typical company whose only job is to look up for the shareholder, for the equity owner, a benefit corporation in its bylaws says that it actually takes care of all stakeholders. So that includes employees, it includes the community, it includes the environment. So to make decisions at the board in a very different way with a very different uh, fiduciary responsibility. And Mob Squad, where I'm the, the board chair and was the, and the founder of the company, is a B Corp as an example. It's got a financial outcome, but also social outcome for, for Canada and our employees. Um, and so that's sort of traditional sort of social finance. And, you know, my involvement, David, you asked, I mean, I chaired the first, first social impact bond in health in Canada, so the Heart and Stroke Foundation uh, launched to reduce the incidence of stroke. It was very successful um, and paid our investors back. And so these are investors that took a risk to put up equity capital, that if we didn't deliver our social outcome, they would take capital loss. And if we did, they would get a small gain. Um, and so it's a very uh, unique financial instrument, but it really aligns incentives. Um, I also have started B Corp, uh, B Corp. I've invested in B Corps. Um, I've invested in companies personally uh, and also in our fund that we believe have outcomes that are greater than just uh, the financial return to the fund. An example is I, at Relay, where I'm a managing partner, we invested in a digital journalism organization. Um, we expect to get a financial return, but part of why we're doing it is because we believe that the media quality media is important to democracy and we think that that's failing right now um and so there's absolutely a social outcome there i also chair the board of hard strokes um impact funds so we have a 40 million dollar fund that invests not grants but actual dollars into companies that we believe if they can commercialize a technology that we grant funded will actually have an out uh, outcome and an impact on uh canadians health as it relates to heart disease and stroke so that's what i'd say is traditional what I'm finding fascinating as an investor is that I feel like, you know, social finance came out of like the charitable sector in many ways in the social sector, and it's coming into the finance sector. And I'm seeing now that the finance sector is moving into the social sector like as a mainstream investment. So I'll give you a couple of examples of how I think about this. The first is that investors do think forward orientation, right? They think 10 years from now, is this more or less valuable? And if you look at what's happening right now with two important inputs to any company, you have two most important inputs and their resources are human resources and financial resources. Human resources want to work in a, an environment and in an organization where there's more impact than just this is my two and a half year old. The, the people, don't, people, young people, like getting Gen Z, uh, they want to work not just for a paycheck, uh, not all of them, but, but more than I'd say the last generation and why, and more than the generation next. And so if you want to attract the very best people to your company, they're asking questions of like, why does this matter? And then if you think about financial resources, as there's a wealth transfer to the younger generations and they have a different ethos and a different value set, um, that money is moving more towards companies that aren't just trying to deliver a profit, but deliver a return. So traditional investments are moving into the socials, uh, into the social realm, which I think is fascinating and a great example of this in, that we are living right now. If you looked in the last two years in Canadian oil and gas, profits have doubled, tripled, quadrupled. Stock prices are only up 50%. Why? There's a massive rotation of financial resources out of the sector. So even though traditionally they should have doubled, tripled, quadrupled their equity prices, when there's less demand for that product because that money is going towards uh, an opportunity that has like more, um, of, a, of an impact return as well, you're seeing this change. So I think we're getting to this magical place that these, both these things are going to converge. That's great. You know, I've been trying to hold a bit of a spectrum in my mind and we'll maybe start to populate this with a little more specificity as we go on that, that there is perhaps, you know, on one end, we might think there's, there's the good old grants that the nonprofit sector is very familiar with. And then we would look way down the other end of that spectrum to sort of mean, nasty venture capitalism uh, that has one priority in mind and, and that's it. And that there's this sort of emerging space. What I love about that uh, examples that you gave, Irfan, is, is, is to watch the way in which both ends are kind of moving towards the middle in a sense. Yeah, and I think what's interesting also, like, David, you're, you're, like that's what I think is happening. And it's not going to happen overnight. Like, it's going to... It's going to take a decade or two decades where this thing sort of just melts together. And, you know, Sean, to your point, I think the catalytic event is this social finance fund in Canada, at least. 
I think that is going to accelerate this uh, and, and and move this faster than we've seen in the last two or three or four years, which is very exciting for somebody like me to spend my time, you know, in the charitable sector, in the finance sector, but prefers to be in the middle because um, then I can sort of satisfy both things for myself with like that have this like, um, you know, uh, sort of dichotomy in my life. What I find interesting so far is that this is in some ways new capital. So, you know, we raised the social impact bond. It was not large. It was about $4 million. We went to our donors at Heart and Stroke as, as a first example, and they gave us money that they wouldn't have given us as a donation. They took part of their financial portfolio to help us. And so that, that's purely added to the nonprofit sector. You know, the challenge I think that, at least for me as a, as a leader, uh, a nonprofit leader, also in the art, not just in health, is trying to figure out how do we do this in the art? Because I've seen it successfully now done in the health sector. I've seen it in other sectors, it's in housing is an example, but the arts, we haven't figured that out yet. Uh, and it's not because we haven't started thinking about it. We still haven't come up with like, what's the, what's the, what's the aha that'll make this happen? And we'll, we'll start the first flow of this type of capital into the sector. I mean, if we could unpack that over the next hour, we will have uh, done all right for ourselves. So I hope we can kind of stay close to that as a basic challenge. What does it mean to figure this out within the cultural sector? Um, I always have to take myself back to a fairly basic sense. Like I, I have to admit to both of you that it took me a long time to go, oh, it's not a grant. It was so, well, you're growing up inside the cultural nonprofit world. You think there's grants and these kinds of grants and those kinds of grants and, you know, grant, grant, but everything's a grant. It, just to get my head around the idea of repayable finance. Uh, and to say, this is, this is about creating loans that help you do things that you couldn't do otherwise. And so just as a sort of preliminary definitional moment for me, I go, okay, I have to stop thinking about grants and I have to start thinking about loans that are sympathetic to the kinds of things I'm trying to accomplish. The next piece of that, that I had to sort of fill in then is to say, if we're going to get those loans, those loans that are balancing social impacts with financial impacts, a kind of social return and, and a financial return integrated, I've got to figure out how to talk about my social impact. I've got to come up with some way to say to a, to a you know, in a conversation, say, well, what is the social impact that you're putting on the balance sheet here? I wasn't terribly well equipped to do that. Uh, and so I'd be interested from both of you just to, to hear a little bit of, of your thoughts on how the art sector can show up in that question of social impact, how social impact is starting to weave together with financial impact when we're de dealing with impact investing opportunities. And then what is, you know, what's the cultural sector's play inside that conversation? Well, I I'm happy to jump in on this because, um, and, uh, and, and take it, take it back in a couple of different directions here that I think are useful. One is, um, you know, just thinking about who is looking at and who's making these decisions. Um, you know, when when Irfan is talking about that, we basically have, you know, this part that's coming out of the charitable sector and that's part that's coming out of the financial sector. And they're sort of coming together. Uh, it is, I think that is absolutely true that that's what's happening. And it also in a lot of ways exposes one of, I think, the critical weaknesses in the current social finance space. So I remember being at a um, workshop uh, out in Vancouver with the, uh, uh, that was actually being held at the Van City Credit Union. That was probably about a dozen years ago. And uh, I don't say historically Van City and the ecosystem around there has been one of, uh, certainly on the leading edge of this space uh, across Canada. There's there's a few hot spots, and that's definitely one of them. And one of the things that they, some of the folks there were saying at that point was that the challenge that they're facing in this impact investing space is that um, you know, we don't know whether the right thing to do is train our bankers in how to be social workers or train our social workers in how to be bankers. Um, because the thing is, either of those directions doesn't actually suit impact investing particularly well. And there still is a real gap in understanding, like the integration of both those things in a really synergistic way is something that as a social finance sector, you know, writ large across Canada, and, and I will say actually around the world, no one has really figured out entirely yet. So how do you talk to the financiers? It's tricky. Everyone's still figuring it out. So don't think the arts and cultural sector is particularly far behind there. No one has really nailed it yet. Um, but I will say that you actually have a lot of things that are worth 
thinking about as a starting point, a lot of skills that you've already developed that I think are still applicable. They're just worth reframing. So let's even take the idea of a grant. Like what's a grant? Is a gr- When someone says, you know, to, to those who are uninitiated, for those who haven't gone through grant writing, grant receiving, grant management processes, you know, someone completely outside of the sector, you know, when you're, when you're at a, a holiday dinner or at a barbecue in the summer, and ask you, what do you do? Oh, I, I write grants for arts and cultural organizations. Oh, that's great. You get free money because you do this art stuff. Like, sure. Okay. As you all know, no, that's not what it is. Um, but as a starting point, you know, one of the ways we often frame granting is as really like it's donations, but bigger. And, and some of them are. But in practice, a lot of grants look like um, someone is buying something from you. Now, the people who are paying for it aren't necessarily the ones who are consuming it. Um, you know, this funder here, this arts council here, is paying you, paying your organization to perform some artistic and cultural activities that are then used, consumed, enjoyed by an audience over here. Um, and although you could theoretically say, well, yeah, but the Arts Council or the, the other funder is being funded through tax dollars by, by the audience some way anyway, it's so indirect. Like there's no way that the individual taxpayer is looking at that and going, aha, 13 cents of my income tax this year went towards this performance. So I am paying for that performance. Like it's not the same way as buying a chocolate bar or you know, buying, a, buying a, a Tim's coffee in the morning. In that case, you know, you are paying for it, you are consuming it, the funder and the customer are the same person. But what you are in the position for with many grants is that you essentially have this organization, whether it's a foundation or it's an arts council or, or something else, that is kind of acting as the de facto purchaser of what your the, the performance, the artistic and cultural events that and products that you're putting on. So they're paying for it but they aren't necessarily the ones who are actually consuming it. They aren't, they aren't the direct audience themselves. So how do you fill in that gap? How do you tell this funder that this audience enjoys that work? Well, that's where a lot of your reporting comes in. You are, you are telling this purchaser that this consumer is enjoying their work by reporting back on the community impacts, the cultural benefits, um, the fact that people showed up to performances, the people the fact that people viewed paintings, people downloaded songs, all those, all those pieces. Um, and you are, as the recipient of the grant, you're referring back on it, acting in some ways as the proxy for the audience. You're making the case. Why am I framing grants in that way? Well, because if you think about grants in that way, then a lot of the grants aren't, they aren't free money. They are, you are selling a service already. Uh, you're selling a service to the audience. It just happens that your audience aren't the ones paying for it. Someone else is paying for it. You're, you're connecting those things together. Um, when it comes to impact investors, you know, they might be giving you equity or debt instead of a grant. But what they're looking for in terms of that social impact, and what they're looking at in terms of the cultural return, is that same storytelling. You already have a lot of those skills. You already have a lot of that capacity. What you're in some sense doing is adding onto that, the capacities of um, bookkeeper, accountant, a CFO, uh, to couple with that so that you can not just report back on the cultural returns and the cultural impact, but also on what the financial piece looks like too. Um, because ultimately what you're often doing with an impact investment is you're kind of doing two things simultaneously. There's part of it that looks like a grant. Now, I don't mean looks like a grant in terms of you don't get your money back. I mean, it looks like a grant in terms of someone has to tell the story that someone appreciates and uses the resources in a way that is, you know, value for money for the grantor, has the cultural impact, has the economic and social benefit. While at the same time, you also have a loan. And, you know, paying back a loan, it's, I have a mortgage on my house. It looks like that. Um, but you're kind of doing both things at the same time. Um, I would also say, given how early we still are in the impact investing space, what that looks like for your funder, for your, 
for for the social financier, the impact investor, is still um, there's not one common thing that people are looking for. There's still a lot of variation in what that looks like, and um, and this is where you know your experiences as as arts consultants, I think, actually brings a lot of value to the table already because. Um, unless you just work with a single granting organization, you're probably used to the fact that different funders, different grantors have different reporting requirements, different things they're looking for, different visions of, of what they're trying to achieve and different stories they want to tell to their stakeholders. Um, so that flexibility of being able to tell, you know, in some sense, the same story in different ways is I think a strength that you can bring to the table. Um, and that looks different from, you know, the debt side. Uh, uh, my mortgage at my bank right now, um, you know, I refinanced my my mortgage last year, and I got to tell you, yeah, you know, it was with a different financial institution. They were looking for the same thing. It basically looked the same to both of them. Whether I go to any of the big five banks or any of the large credit unions or any of that the, the mortgage companies um, that work in this space, they're all basically looking for the same stuff. You can tell them the same story. But I know if I go to five different granting agencies, I'm going to have to tell them five different stories most of the time. And so um, so I think in a lot of ways, what you're doing in the impact investing space, if you're getting in there, doesn't look that, you know, there's parts that look very different um, in terms of the the reporting back to and communicating back with your funder. Um, but they don't look as different as, as it might seem from your current work at first glance. Um, and I am going to just sort of Put a pin in an idea, which is going to, which I'm sure we'll come back to in the conversation, is that I think where a lot of uh, the real challenging mindset changes are is that all that said in terms of the reporting, the impact, the, the financing, and all that, I think the bigger challenge is actually come with the organization's capacity internally and how you think about your strategic plans, your vision, vision values. I think that strategy side is in a lot of ways much more difficult than the actual impact investing side of it compared to your current kind of capacities and approaches. Right. I'm seeing that a lot in the conversations that I've had with different organizations who have done this is that in the end, one of the things that a common theme they say is, look, it wasn't really the money, right? It wasn't the, the new capital that we had access to. It was the capacity that we developed as an organization in terms of dealing with repayable finance instead of a grant. And the result of doing that is that we're, we're even more proficient at dealing with grants than we were before. So there's a kind of demand that this this finance uh, strategy puts on an organization that, that that helps it across the board. I feel like it's still useful for for me to 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 get a, a more of a concrete sense of what this landscape entails. And uh, in a in a piece of reading that I was doing uh, recently, they broke it down in terms of supply side, demand side, and intermediaries. And uh, Irfan, I'm wondering if you would just uh, grab hold of that that way of breaking up this landscape and just help me understand that in a little more concrete terms. When someone's saying supply side or demand side inside an impact investing context, what are they referring to there? And and what is this thing known as an intermediary in, in, in inside this space? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's a great question. And, you know, again, this is like makes it and complicated. And it, the definitions come with so many different things, right? Do so you bring up, David, like the idea of this is a, it's not a grant, it's like a repayable loan. Well, that's one structure. There's also equity structures, right? Where people get a piece of a, of a business. So I'll give you an example in the arts, which is I was pitched an opportunity to invest in a company that has created a marketplace that allows more artists to have access to sell their visual arts works at a much lower commission than a standard gallery. So first, you know, barrier to get the gallery to carry you is a, is a real barrier for visual artists. The second is if you get one, they take half of what of the revenue is. And so a business that has created a marketplace that's enabled by technology that couldn't have happened 30 years ago for individual arts consumers to be able to purchase a broader variety of art is good for the consumer. It's good for the artist. And there's a business in that. So is that a grant? It's not really a grant. It's a business, but it's got a social outcome, right? Um, so the, that, that's social finance, in my opinion, right? Like enabling that to happen. It's a, it's, it's a betterment to society for, you know, and there's, um, I think for artists, you know, that's a cost to galleries, right? So there's, there's a whole debate around like if that, what, what's the net benefit uh, to the sector, but I would view it still as positive. Um, 
on the supply side, what we mean is the supply of capital. And to me, I, I do view this as a different pool of capital. For those of us uh, that are fortunate to have an investment account, um, you know, we have income that we donate, uh, and then we have this like our RRSP. What's a different pool of capital? Uh, and so but that's the supply, you know, people that want to do something good with their money, and not just get a financial return. The demand is the institutions that, that have desire, right, for, for this capital, whether that's, you know, an example I could give you is, you know, sort of just trying to spitball, like, like what could this be used for in the arts? I mean, uh, I think it's actually reasonably standard to get grant uh, money to put on programming, active programming, whether that's uh, a performance or whether that's a new show. Um, like that's a normal thing that people can get grants for, whether it's from the Canada Council or otherwise, right? Um, it's slightly more difficult to get a grant, but still possible to get a grant for capital construction. Uh, so if you think about like building a new gallery, um, I think it's very hard to get a grant, but maybe still possible, very hard to get a grant to build a restaurant inside an art gallery. Like I think that people would be like, I don't know, but Having a restaurant inside an art gallery make people stay longer, more likely to come, maybe go to more shows. Like there's a real net benefit to a gallery to have a restaurant. So they all do, right? Could you get a repayable grant to do that? Right. So effectively alone. So that I look at that and say, if you build a restaurant and the business plan works, it will be profitable and you can afford to pay it back. So we're sort of filling that hole that you don't get to own a part of the gallery. It's not a grant for programming that we have big pools for, but this other thing that actually is added into the system, how does that work, right? And so you can see that being both the demand for that capital and could some people say, well, you know what, instead of buying a 2% GIC, which is lower risk, I'm gonna get an 8% return on this loan because I'm taking higher risk, but it's to a gallery I care about. And so that's kind of like trying to balance out that, that, that question that you have, like what's supply and demand? Who is the intermediary? Um, is the last piece of your question. Well, for those of us that want to make those investments, like we're not calling, you know, the Vancouver Art Gallery and saying, hey, can I give you like 10 grand and can you give me 8% on it? <laughs> Let me know what you get. Like, this is not going to happen, right? And unfortunately, you know, like there isn't the capacity in any of these cultural institutions where there isn't people sitting around doing nothing, right? This, this doesn't happen. And so the intermediary is the person that facilitates that transaction and makes sure it's actually put, being put together and done well. Um, in the social finance sector, the social impact bonds, um, the supply of capital um, is actually coming from two places, right? It's coming from the ultimate payer, which is usually the government, if this social um, intervention is successful and from the private markets. Um, and the demand is often like at Hard Stroke, with Hard Stroke Foundation, we were the intermediary. So we just put staff on, okay, let's put together the project plan, let's document what it looks like. Um, but we did it with volunteers that had been doing that before. And for a lot of organizations, like they just don't have those types of volunteers. And so there are organizations, Mars does this in Toronto as an example, where they'll be the group that will help the charity build the business plan, make sure that it makes sense make sure that they believe that they would be in demand uh, in the market for that supply of capital, and then takes it to a network of people that they believe would be interested in that. So it's like sort of the, it's a matchmaker role. So typically sitting between these, these roles of funding is the supply side, organization is the demand side, intermediary is an organization, an entity that can shape the relationship between those two effects. And, and, and maybe itself as a social organization doing it for free, because that's their mission is to help achieve this. Um, or maybe it's a, it's being paid some small fee to, to put that together. You know, as it relates to the social finance fund, that's a different structure. And then this is getting capital into investors that are investing in businesses that have social outcomes in addition to financial outcomes. Well, like think about that business. That's how is the government going to get from ESDC money into that business? And so there's a series of intermediaries that, that and they do that. It could be venture capital firms that are focused on funding B clubs. Right. And, 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 and I just, yeah, I, ahead, I just man. wondered, you know, I think um, one of the things that Airfund has brought up, and I think this is a really important piece here, is that social finance isn't just one thing. Impact investing isn't just one thing. There's a lot of different structures and ways of, of putting it together. 
and and they all have to be approached differently. Um, I think the social impact bond is a really good example of a structure that which we would call kind of broadly a, a pay for performance kind of structure. Like ultimately, it's about hitting some sort of target, and you know there's uh, there's good and bad in that. And, and you know one of the core challenges there is is demonstrating that you've actually hit the target, which is why social impact bonds tend to be focused on very easily measurable targets um, compared to some other approaches. Um, some other ones look more like kind of what I uh, talked about earlier, which is um, which is uh, uh, investments in businesses, investments in enterprises, be they debt or equity, where they're looking for some sort of reported or measurement of the, the social or environmental impact. Uh, and they may have that um, kind of specified out front. There may or may not be a pay for performance element to it, but often there's a little more wiggle room than what that looks like. There's also types of impact investing, investing which don't necessarily even have you know, measurement at its core, even though the social environmental impact is there. Um, and, and I'm thinking of some, a couple of examples here which are, which are worth raising because this might also be actually attractive to some of the, the organizations who are looking at this. Um, one is, um, so there's a, an organization in Toronto called the Center for Social Innovation, which is, uh, um, was originally started as kind of a, a shared space incubator facility for social purpose organizations. And, um, and they're originally out of space on kind of its Spadina and Queen in, in downtown Toronto and then wanted to expand. And so they bought, so they're looking to buy a building on Bathurst, kind of a Bathurst and Bloor. And they wanted to buy the building. And so they wanted to raise the money for it. Well, what did they do? They, they issued community bonds. And so these were kind of like at market or slightly below market rate uh, bonds that they were selling um, with the assistance of a financial intermediate, with the assistance of a credit union who helped kind of administer and manage the, the, the back end of all that. Um, they were like, you know what, we want to we want to sell these bond, community bonds on one or five or ten thousand dollars a piece, and use that to finance the purchase of this building. And so the way that they raised that money, the network that they went to, is all of their tenants. They had a few dozen social purpose organizations who were tenants, and basically went to them and said, and this kind of goes back to to what your friend was saying about bringing in new capital, said to them, hey, your donors, who who donate to your organizations, do you think any of them would be interested in helping pool money together to buy this building? And they did very successfully. And so they were able to buy this building on Bathurst Street, retrofit it, and fit you know, 100 more organizations into their network because of that. And they've since expanded that, that model elsewhere. They actually spun off a, an organization called Tapestry Capital, which specifically um, uh, focuses on setting up and managing these these uh, so these um, community bonds, and um, but if you think about like what the impact measurement looks like for that, um, you know they do some reporting out about what the what the impact was, but really what the impact measurement was is that the people who were investing in uh, in CSI, the Center for Social Innovation, through their community bonds, could talk to the organizations that hooked them up with that investment in the first place and go, hey. Is the construction happening? Is the space better? Are the services better? And they could, they could also go onto Bathurst Street, look in front of the building and go, huh, that building is there. That's the evidence. That's the story, is the thing itself. Um, locally here in, in, in Waterloo Region, um, there's a, a, an affordable housing uh, uh, real estate investment co-op called Union Sustainable Development Co-op. I'm a member. I bought a $500 share. I, I, I provided them with a ten thousand um, uh, dollar debt investment, um, and very much the same thing. Like, what is the impact? What is the measurable impact there? Well, they report out about how many affordable housing units they provide, but also I can go out to Lancaster Street and Kitchener, see that those buildings are there, and go, "Oh, that's the story. That's the measurement. Is the thing," and so. Um, when Irfan was talking about, you know, this idea of for say like an arts or cultural space, putting in a restaurant in some sense, like what is the impact? What's the story? It's the fact that when you go to a concert now, you can also get a snack. That's the story. That's your, that's your demonstrable measurement. Um, and you know, the, some of the additional measure, uh, um, 
impact stories and measurement will come out of that. Like you can also talk about as an arts organization that this has brought in more people. This has let us put on bigger performances. This has meant, meant that we can put on performances th um, five nights a week instead of two nights a week. Like you can tell those stories too. But ultimately, a lot of the proof in the pudding, especially if your investors are in fact the community you're primarily serving, comes from the fact they're going to show up and they're going to see it and go, wow, this makes my arts and cultural center a more vibrant, interesting, better place that I want to spend more time in. Right. Irfan, you said something pretty tantalizing early in the conversation that I want to circle back to around the ESDC program, this $750 million that we're hearing a lot about that's set to change the social finance landscape in Canada, describing this perhaps as a catalytic moment uh, for this work. And I'm wondering if I could uh, get you to couple that with the, 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 the feeling that you had that culture is not quite there yet, that a catalytic moment is coming for the social finance strategy in Canada and culture may be just a few steps behind. Can you sort of give us a sense of why you think there's a catalytic moment coming and then what it is that culture might need to do to catch that train? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think part of what's going to happen here, if I understand what they're doing um, correctly, is that by putting capital out, um, I think they will create larger and many more intermediaries, which is a piece that's somewhat missing. Um, like there is demand for this capital from companies that have social orientation, B Corps, people that are trying to pursue sustainable development goals, people that are actually working in the DEI space as it relates to entrepreneurship and venture, because it's terrible. I mean, the number of funded female entrepreneurs, number of female funded black and indigenous people of color entrepreneurs is not where it needs to be. And so there's demand there. Um, and part of why I get comfortable this is going to work is if I understand it, well, they're going to do something similar here that the, the government has done in the venture capital industry already. They have a program called Vicky, which provides first loss capital, and it encourages private investors based on the structures they've created to de-risk opening their, their own balance sheets and their own portfolios to a new asset class they maybe don't have as much experience in. So 10 years ago, a lot of Canadian investors wanted that same venture capital because they didn't understand it. They thought it was risky. And this Vicky program, a venture capital catalyst initiative, really has opened up a substantial amount of private capital into the space. And I think that now that these private investors have had experience investing and receiving returns, they're more likely to continue. And so I think that's the catalyst event that's going to happen. That people are like, I don't know if I can take this ten thousand dollar risk on this bond. I've never seen a product like this. Well, what if the government helps structure it in a way that they took some of the risk out of it? So you're more likely to jump into it, right? And then if you have a positive experience, you're more likely to do it again. Uh, and so I think that's um, the piece that uh, I think, uh, I believe will lead to, it takes a long time, right? VCAP and two Vicky per have been 15 years in the making, so let's not expect the next few are gonna be different. But I think the early investors are going to be the winners here. And I say that because um, this is a Wayne Gretzky state to where the puck is going in energy. If you buy, uh, apartment building as an investor that's at a 9% cap rate and you know it's going to be at a 6% cap rate in the future and the math on that would be if you have a dollar of revenue and a 9% cap rate is worth $11 if you have a dollar of revenue or sorry profit it's got a 6% cap rate uh, it's worth $16 16 times 6% since the dollar 11 times you know 9% is the dollar um, so if you knew that was going to happen you buy a building for 11 and sell it for 16, would you do it? Of course, I mean, that's a pretty good investment for a physical asset. Well, what makes the nine go to six? It's, it's the supply of capital being more interested in that building. And I believe the supply of capital is going to be more interested in the social finance substantially more in the future than it has in the past. And so you have this high level weight of capital coming in with a set number of assets, pricing of those assets must go up. And so therefore, um, I think that the early investors in these social finance products and the social finance funds are going to um, be very well compensated for taking, you know, new outside, uh, but somewhat hopefully risk constrained uh, investment positions. It's an exciting time. I mean, that's my hope. It's entirely possible. This is like risky and it doesn't work. And remember, like a lot of this is going to be new managers that have never managed capital. 
right? There's not many black or indigenous asset managers of venture funds, if any, really, in the country. So giving money to a new manager is a huge risk. But I think the tidal waves will be in that direction. So I think they have some talent. I think the government program is going to help be rifting. I think in the totality of all that, 10 years from now, we'll have more people doing this in a way that's different than they have before. Right. But you're giving us a story similar to the one at the beginning where you saw once that strategy was put in place, it actually leveraged new money that came to the table that wouldn't have done so before. We have the example of happening three times with three other programs in the past in Canada. So we can at least point to, yes, it's social finance and it's not venture capital, but it's been successful before. So it's not entirely new to you to take this risk. And maybe some of those investors that were early investors of venture capital, you know, if you invest in venture capital in Canada in 2006, 2007, 2008, you've done very, very well. And if they remember that experience, be like, yeah, being early is maybe where the opportunity is. I mean, people that invested in venture capital last year aren't so happy this year. <laughs> I will. I will say to you know build on what what everyone was uh, was bringing forward, the you know there the idea of having first loss capital in here, which is which is in some sense what a lot of this um, the social financial fund money is likely to be. Like what that is doing is you know it's de risking. It means that um, social finance fund money goes in, other investor money goes in. If things go bad comes out of the social finance funds pocket first. Um, isn't isn't actually even entire you know, we're talking about this from the um, from the venture capital side. It's not even entirely new from the the social investment side space in Canada either. Um, you know, I I am based in Ontario, so I am an Anglophone, but uh, I know that a quarter of Canada is in Quebec and there's a lot of really interesting stuff that has happened there with a bit of a longer track record. And so um the Chante uh, de l'Economie Sociale, which which operates exclusively in Quebec, and it has been doing so since the, in, in its precursors since really the 1970s, has been experimenting with a lot of first loss capital for social and cooperative ventures uh, for decades now. And a lot of what is, is happening with the social finance sector, with the Canadian Social Finance Fund, um, in a lot of ways is, is, is trying to take learning that has happened in Quebec and, and trying to bring them throughout Canada. I mean, not just from Quebec, but, but um, certainly other, other government Canada funds as well. Um, so I think you're right. I think there's a, there's a track record there um, that this might be leading into in potentially a really positive way. Um, and then to also add to that, um, because of the peculiarities of the, the, the social purpose organization space, um, this is where that funding for the investment readiness program came in. So uh, with the original announcement of the $755 million um, and to talk about the private uh, sector matching, um, the idea was that, um, and, and we'll see we'll see how when, when dollars start flowing, I see there was a question about this, which, which I'm assuming we'll, we'll get to through the chat. But when um, when we see the dollars flowing, like the, the goal when this was announced in 2018 was that it would never be just the Canadian Social Finance Fund that would be investing. It was always going to be, you know, I think their goal was, was to have, um, for most of their investments, a three to one private sector investor match for every dollar that went out from the Canadian Social Finance Fund um, with a ratio that was closer to one to one when they were looking at um, uh, uh, equity deserving groups who, as, as again, your friend rightly pointed out, um, have traditionally faced a lot of barriers to accessing capital and also managing capital. Um, uh, one of the investment readiness program partners, New Power Labs, uh, if you're curious, has actually been doing a lot of research around uh, and trying to kind of trying to track the demographics of people who manage and make decisions in, in the financial sector to, to, to try and firm down those numbers a bit better. Um, but the but the the investment readiness program, which um, in its first offering was fifty million dollars of grants that were given out, about three quarters to social purpose organizations, and we're in a second round of it, which is another fifty million right now, was pri is primarily focused on building the capacity side. Is uh, so it's sort of de-risking it from a different angle. It's not de-risking it as a first loss investor. It's de-risking trying to de-risk it through the building of capacity for both. The social purpose organizations themselves to be able to manage this this investment, but also the kind of ecosystem around them that um, 
that plays a role in in matching training developing the skills to to be able to engage in in social finance so it, it you know it, it's part of what makes me curious because i got very interested in in this topic after realizing that i you know, I run a small cultural nonprofit uh, in Eastern Canada. On, on two separate occasions, we've done uh, repayable finance on different projects. But there was no, I didn't know what impact investing was. And there was, you know, we looked around to find the best possible capital that we could access. And it was a commercial bank that we ended up working with. Um, or in, in one case, it was a community bank, but the interest rates on that community bank were you know, once they kicked in, they were very high. Uh, and so I'm, I've been very curious as to say, well, what is it about the cultural sector and the funders that are surrounding the cultural sector that have been late to the game on this? That question of capacity. Yeah, yeah. You know, I missed that question. You asked that question already, David. And I, you know, I missed that in my last response. And, and there's a couple of questions in the chat. And I'd love to hear what other people are thinking. And, no, we're going to get the big, big group here. So um, I think in the cultural sector, the issue has been in other sectors, the um, the methodology to measure success is often clearer, and so in other charitable sectors, it's very clear to say, like with housing, did you get you know a hundred people into affordable housing that didn't have affordable housing before? You can actually really measure that pretty simply. The first social impact bond was in prisoner of recidivism in the United Kingdom. Did the people go back to jail or not? I mean, it's very simple. I find in the arts, a lot of our impact is like changing society, changing conversations, changing discourse, um, and, you know, frankly, improving um, the overall discussion in the public square. There's a whole series of things that we do. Uh, how do you measure them? I mean, you can measure how many people come to a show, but is that really the impact, right? There's also a bit of a, a, a sorting piece that comes here too. So. You know, David, you were talking about being able to actually have repayable finance twice already, but outside of the the umbrella of impact investing, um, just sort of happening with a community bank or a commercial bank. Um, you know, not all impact investing is going to flow through the Canadian Social Finance Fund. Um, a lot of the capacities are getting built, like will hopefully in many cases lead to organizations that, you know, while they're waiting for the social finance fund money to flow. After that capacity is built, they now look attractive to a commercial bank or a credit union or or some other uh, set of set of lenders or investors, um, and and so you know we will I think um, I think there's a lot of that that probably already happens. We we just don't call it that. We don't uh, we don't uh, we don't have that terminology about it. Uh, you know, it's do I think do I think that my favorite Ethiopian restaurant in Kitchener provides a lot of cultural value? I absolutely do. Do I think there's any impact investment money flowing towards Muya and Jara? No, I don't. But I think I have great meals there, and I'm sure they have financing from a commercial bank. Um, you know, I think there's a it's it's in some sense um, a lot of the question is you know there's already you know, in. And, and this isn't, and I'll say this isn't just a, uh, for the cultural sector. It's actually a lot of socially impactful sectors. There's already parts of these sectors that are commercially viable for mainstream lenders, and in some sense, what the impact investing is doing is, is bringing in a bit of a different angle, and hopefully creating some space that is a bit different, and hopefully opening up some space that is again, new capital that is not just what the commercial lenders are going for or just what traditional granting agencies would go for either. Um, and one of the reasons social impact bonds have been in the spaces that I've already mentioned is uh, the easy measurability. And the thing is, easy measurability is also the stuff that makes a lot of government programs and grants attractive too. And so, you know, the more that the impact investing looks like stuff that government already does, cool, get to have more money in there, but it, but it doesn't open as much space as when we get into these more complex group theories. It is going to be the walk before we run, right? Like as we reinforce that, we will we'll take more and more risk and get to more and more nebulous outcome measurement, right? We can get more and more comfortable, but we're not going to hop there. And I think that's why this sector, it's been hard for this sector to lead, um, but I don't think it's not going to happen. But, you know, I'm suspicious that it's going to be, like, I feel like there's enough people that would entertain happily the sense that, okay, you know what, I'll take your social value, your social impact at face value, you're an arts organization, I think the arts are great. You're in when it comes to a question of the social impact uh, aspect of this. 
But then the arts organization said, okay, what am I going to do where I feel like I can return this money? What's the project that I might take on where I feel like I'm going to get to the end of that project and I'm going to be in a position to put this money back in the hands of the investors, even at a very, you know, kind, patient, flexible, low interest loan. Whatever I mean, it depends if you're, if, if you're looking at it as debt or equity. Because if it's like, you know, we've had social finance in the arts. Think about like how musicals get funded, right? Like people taking equity risk where they probably are going to lose it. But if it works and they funded Hamilton, you get like 10 times their money back. Um, it's social finance. It's an equity trend. If you, they don't look at it and say, how am I going to get this money back? It's like, maybe I'll get it back in the next spade. And maybe I won't. Yeah. Or, or, I mean, think about things that are less, you know, where you're less likely to see that sort of um, explosive return, um, where it might not be the equity model, it might be the debt model. But then when it comes to thinking about you know, the arts organization strategically, um, uh, some of it might be, can you come up with complementary lines of revenue? The, 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 the snack bar, the restaurant that's in the location, that could be one, which is great, you know, if you can make it work. It's also e very easy to not make it work. Like if you, you know, the thing is, I think a restaurant is really hard. You, you could strategically set yourself up for, oh man, we have an arts organization that's losing some money and we've added on to it a restaurant that's losing a lot of money. Great. You know, that doesn't make you particularly viable, which is where I think the st strategy and capacity is really important there. But it might also be, you know, looking at, uh, thinking about more creatively sources of revenue. Um, which then is, I think, kind of wheels around to one of the things I was saying at the beginning is that like your strategy, your vision is one of the things that is, is in some sense going to be hardest to deal with this. So, you know, if I think of an urban environment and think about an arts organization, you know, in a place like Toronto or, or even where I am in, in, you know, Kitchener, Waterloo, which is undergoing a lot of growth, um, what's the thing that's really appealing? Like living in a cool neighborhood and what makes the neighborhood really cool? Having a vibrant art scene. Cool. Do you want to take a whole bunch of money from property developers who are going to build a bunch of condos? Because you could do that. You can get the sponsorship. Um, and that might be good. That might be that might be a fit for your type of, you know, for your type of organization. But if also at the same time, you're putting on a bunch of plays which are talking about the blight of gentrification and how it's creating a boom in homelessness in your town. Like, when is the money worth it and when isn't it? And so ultimately, like you know, the the core thing is the money is going to get repaid. Um, is the way that are the decisions you're making to create the lines of income that will repay that? Do they align with your vision as an artistic organization, or do they undermine it? This is a, a concept that's called mission drift in the social enterprise space, and um, uh, you know this is part of the reason I say it's not a good, it's not the right fit for everyone. Is that um, is that there is there there are always dangers of mission drift um, when you're getting into more of these spaces. But it's you know thinking about what you're doing is it complementary with your goals? Um, you know if you want to make arts accessible, great. Are you going to charge Are you going to charge school kids a hundred dollars a ticket to show up at your show? You can generate more revenue. Might it be undermining your mission? And I think those are open questions that only any individual organization has to has to think about. And this is, you know, in some sense, this is the conversation that has to happen before you think about impact investing, not afterwards. Is it safe enough for me to just say, look, this is about impelling cultural organizations to develop a stronger entrepreneurial capacity, the ability to spot those opportunities where revenue aligns with mission and then to develop the capacity within their organizations to handle finance that may have levels of accountability that are more strenuous than a grant. Is that, a, I mean, am I sort of describing what this step would look like in, in a fair way there? I think this has always been the case though, David. Like I think that any charitable organization, art organizations not accepted, have had to become more innovative over time or they die, right? And so this is just what's the current innovation that's required. And I think it is about pools of capital that are becoming available. And again, I don't think this is replacing capital, but if you're an organization where you have, you know, grants, donations, earned revenue as your model, and there's another one that's in a similar space that has those plus this other social finance lever, they're more likely to be more interesting things and be more resilient and more likely to succeed and survive. 
And so, but that's been the case, you know, go back two decades and what the innovation was then in, in the nonprofit sector. So yes, you gotta be more innovative, like always. <laughs> right. right. And I think there's a, but I'll also add, you know, there's, there's a, a certain, there's a certain angle that, um, is a, is I think a continual challenge. You know, we were talking about moving from the one end of the, like the financiers getting into the play versus the charities getting into the play and kind of beating together as the outcomes become murkier and murkier. Like it's harder to say, yes, we achieved it or no, we didn't achieve it. What becomes more and more important. And this is a thing that I've certainly seen, you know, I think, I think early on in impact investing, when the terminology came around just after the 2008 financial crisis, the conversation was all about hard, measurable impacts. Great, cool. Then the only things we're going to be funding are criminal recidivism, affordable housing, and carbon offsets. Done. Like, like no, social impact is much broader than that. Environmental impact is much broader than that. But the, the, the less that is black or white telling the story of what is achieved, what becomes more important is storytelling. And I got to tell you, if you're an arts organization that's not good at storytelling, like, what are you doing? That's kind of the point. Um, and that, I think, is, is actually a capacity that becomes more and more important as this whole marketplace develops. Um, and, you know, lean into that. Lean into your strengths. If the conversation about imp impact investing for your arts organization just stays at the level of your CEO and your board of directors, um, then I don't know if it's going to work for you. I think you actually need to think about the strategy more broadly and include your artists in there. Right. I'm just going to jump to some questions that have been coming in on the chat before we close. The first one may relate to the second one, so I'm going to throw them both out there. And I leave it to you guys to, to jump in where you see fit. First of all, from Michael Trent, why has it taken so long for the social finance fund to be dispersed? We've all been sort of curious about that in terms of watching that. Uh, and are you surprised by anything that came out of the readiness fund? I'm going to just add Victoria's question to this. It may relate in the way that you guys track through the answer to the first one, or you can bookmark it for a second one. But where do we go to learn how to do this properly? I would have immediately evoked the readiness fund as a way to do that, but perhaps you've been surprised by something there that makes that not the right answer. Uh, I, I'm happy to talk a bit about both of those pieces from, from you know, not quite the inside, but I think about as close to the inside as you're going to get. Um, so why is it taking so long to disperse? Um, two pieces, which are uh, interrelated. One is, in some sense, the obvious one. We're all on Zoom right now. We've all been on Zoom for three years. A pandemic made things really messy um, and slowed things down. Now, I think they were probably expecting the social finance fund dollars to flow, you know, by 2019 or 2020, and this got in the way. Um, but I think there's also another piece that has slowed down the the, the disbursement of the social finance funds. So you remember, you know, we we're talking about a bit of this is about capacity for our organizations being able to manage something other than grants. Well, as a grant recipient, yes, that's a thing. And that is hard to build that capacity. You're not the only ones who don't have the capacity to run things that are a bit more complex than just grants. Government doesn't always have the capacity to run things more complex than grants. And, and, and this, I think, has been, um, my sense is that that has actually been a challenge from the federal government side of things, is figuring out how to structure things within the rules, the regulations, the policies that run throughout the federal government. Um, for for a, a federal ministry that's you know almost entirely uh, has worked on grants, um, grants and contribution agreements and all these other uh, bits of, of running government programming, they're not used to managing repayable debt or equity instruments either. Um, now I will say that they, part of the way they've been trying to approach that is that they the money is going to flow out not directly from ESDC; it's going through um, wholesalers. Um, and hopefully we're going to hear fairly soon who those wholesalers are. I believe they've been selected, but they haven't been publicly announced yet. Um, but I'm expecting sometime this spring or summer, we will, we will get to hear from that. Um, but my understanding is that's been one of the key things that's been holding it back is just internally government, you know, they have this great idea, but then like the actual implementation is, is hard for them. 
uh, too. Pretty fair assessment, I think. I mean, I don't know. Sean, you're probably closer to this uh, and followed it for longer than I have, but I don't think it's a lack of intent. You know, you hear these guys talk about it all the time. So it's not that, um, but I think it is complicated to do. Um, and the challenge will be even when like this gets announced, uh, hopefully, it still then takes time for the capital gains of the economy, right? Like you announce a wholesaler. Well, then the wholesaler has to fit, find funds and those funds have to find investment opportunities. And, you know, it's not going to be fast, um, but it is moving. <laughs> That's good. And in terms of just a cultural organization puts up their hand and says, I'm interested. Where's the first place if they came to either of you, where would you send them? Irfan, do you want to take that? I mean, I say a couple of like people that have done it before, right? So Mars has done a few of these different social finance projects. And so I would say there's people there that are experts. Um, I didn't see all of the recipients of the investment readiness program, but that was the intent of that money. So I try to figure out who those people are and who's local to you, because I think it did go across the country. Um, and so those would be the first two spots that I'd go. Um, I don't know, Sean, do you have other ideas or better ideas? Yeah. So I, I imagine for folks who are looking right now, um, arts organizations who are looking that, um, that, uh, a, a lot of where your interests would probably be going would be to some of those key partners in the investment readiness program who are doing the capacity building. And, uh, the two key ones who I think have been really useful for kind of onboarding, uh, one was, uh, one is the community foundations of Canada. And so they were the first, they were kind of the core hub, um, uh, uh organization or set of organizations really um, for the first round of the investment readiness programming. Um, so they're still useful to reach out to and they still do lots of granting to social purpose organizations for investment readiness. Um, the other one, which um, which uh, uh, has moved very much into the center of the second round of investment readiness program funding is the Canadian Community Economic Development Network. So one of the things about both those organizations is they really do have footprints that go from coast to coast to coast. Um, and, um, you know, even if they don't have on the ground folks, it can kind of help link you with the, the people who might be where you are um, to, to help build those connections. There's, there's, uh, there's a wider range of organizations that are funded, but those are basically the two biggest kind of hub uh, uh, IRP partners from the, the two rounds of the program. And so if, if, if the Canadian Community Economic Development Network says hello, answers the phone, and I say I'm a cultural organization, I'd like to participate in a social finance initiative. Any sense of what the sort of first five questions they ask at that point are? It's a good question because the, what they'll probably do is that um, I think they're they're trying to set themselves almost as like the reception desk for the um, for for the investment readiness program. So they're probably going to want to get a sense of okay. Do you already have earned revenue? Like, are you already selling goods and services that make money? Um, do you have any experience using a repayable capital, uh, whatever that looks like? Um, you know, trying to get a sense of your entrepreneurial culture and whether um, you know to, how much capacity do you already have? And they'd probably be looking at some specific lines of programming too, like a lot of the the both the investment readiness program funds and the the big social finance fund, uh, excuse me, are, are investments that are dedicated to specific population groups like um, indigenous cultural work, um, BIPOC or black uh, cultural work, uh, people of color, um, women, the Canadian Women's Foundation is a big uh, grantor as well. So they'd probably be looking to see if you have any eligibility for some specific programs. Um, but I also know one of the things that that Senet is is particularly taking a lead on right now, and we're working with them on uh, too, is actually trying to develop more peer learning, training, and development capacity as well. Because um, we we know, and the folks in the SDC and the Social Finance Fund know that you know the just the variety of organizations that could potentially be investable is much greater than than the kind of. Like there are four different models of the types of organizations that can be invested in. No, no, no. There's a great variety. And the expertise is going to ultimately be coming from you um, long term. When you say you, Sean, you mean the organization receiving the investment. Yeah, the organization receiving the investment, the organization getting ready. It's that's, you know, 
it's not every arts organization that's going to be in a capacity to do this, but it is going to be the ones who are more entrepreneurial and have more capacity. And you know, the odds are that you're not going to be a perfect fit with anyone's framework are really good. But we're also at a point right now where the frameworks are changing and emerging and, and, and have a lot of wiggle room in play. Um, and the net is being cast fairly widely. I mean, we've been talking a lot just to use the, the, the typology that Efron helped us set up here in supply, demand, and intermediaries. We've been talking a lot about supply and trying to understand supply. Um, you know, in your experience in this field, Erfan, when you look across from the supply side, given your position inside the finance world, how do you look at demand? How do you spot demand? Where do you see it? You know, do you see it sort of lying around there without realizing that it's really good, compelling demand for something like this? Or do you say, you know, it, it's pretty thin in terms of the kind of demand that you think is appropriate to something like this, particularly in the cultural sector? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd separate out the answer to the, the equity investments in like companies. Do I think that women, people of color, black entrepreneurs, indigenous entrepreneurs have good ideas that are not getting funded? Is there more demand than there has been supply to cash capital there? 100%. There's so many papers that are proving that, and there's a mismatch. And the challenge right now is the intermediary, right? Is a black venture capitalist more likely to invest in a black entrepreneur? Probably no black venture capitalists. And so that's part of the challenge. And so we got to figure that part out. Like that's, that's, I think the sticking point as it relates to the charitable sector, um, you know, there's not a ton of supply for social finance in my experience so far. Uh, part of it is that. I don't think there's been enough education. I don't think there's been enough of us actually saying, here are things that I could do if you were to give me a loan. Um, and some of it is we need to see examples. We need to see role models. We need to see other things that have been successful to say, yeah, I could do that, right? So if Gallery A does something in Halifax, Gallery B in Regina can be like, just copy what those guys did, right? And so we need some of that as well to inspire us to create opportunities for, uh, for capital to come in. Sean, do you want to take that? Well, I, I think I totally agree with what everyone was saying there all around. I, I would also say to, I think in some ways, go back to, to somebody who was saying before about new capital that can be brought to the table here. Um, um, think about from the, especially if you're in our, uh, you know, the organization you work, organizations you work with their charities. Think about the ways that you already access new resources. I'm not going to talk about capital here. I'm going to talk about traditional ones, volunteers and donations. You know, what is the way that, what is the, who do you go to first if you're going to try and get donations and you're looking for small scale donations? You go to your volunteers first. They're already invested with you. They already believe in what you're doing. Similarly, if you have donors, who are you going to recruit first if you need volunteers? You're going to go to your current donors. Like you, you know that the people who already have bought in might be looking for new ways to contribute or get involved. Um Similar, that might be new sources of investment capital too. If you end up being in a position where you have some of the uh, uh, some of the right tools that will allow you to do that, I mean, this is probably more in the direction of community bonds, the money that comes out of the social finance fund. But like that's 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 one potential door to knock on, and it's not just individuals; it's also organizationally too. If you have a local foundation in your community that is willing to give you a grant, then if you have something investable. That's probably the first door you should go knock on to say, hey, you know, you 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 have a $10 million endowment. You give away 5% of it every year. We get a chunk of that as a grant. How about moving some of your endowment over to us? Um, because they also might not, you know, know that that is an option, but you can open up that conversation with them. Right. So I know we've got a hard stop at 2.30 Eastern. I want to grab this question from Kate Proctor. This is the last one that came in. Just looking at, you know, the rules that are governing what a not-for-profit or charitable organization can do around earning uh, and how this does or does not mesh with what's emerging in the social impact or social financing space. Have you guys run into this and, and good yeah, advice? Do. Yeah, I mean, the, the quick advice is that it can be complicated. You do need to double check and you do need to get legal advice. And sometimes you need to set up a subsidiary to do this thing. Um, but it's totally doable, but you do need to make sure you're crossing P's and dotting lines because if it if it is in your base entity, sometimes they can trip some, some rules and you could risk your, your registration with the CRA, right? So, but it's doable, but I'm not a lawyer. 
every time I look at this, we hire a lawyer and we say, figure out how to do that. <laughs> uh, 100% back that. Uh, yeah, also not a lawyer, also not an accountant, but those are the folks you need to get on board for this. Uh, I would say a general kind of guidance piece that that I've certainly seen is that uh, what's really important, uh, one of the things that's really important is whether the revenue generation is mission related. Um, the farther outside your core mission you get, the trickier things become. Like there was in the, in the 1980s and early 90s, there was a, uh, in the United States, which has some different but similar rules around this stuff. Um, there were a whole bunch of YMCAs that had their charitable status pulled because effectively they were just operating gyms and they weren't really doing much in terms of community impact stuff. So being able to demonstrate that, being able to demonstrate that uh, um, your revenue is tied to your mission are really key, but this is murky and that's where your lawyers and accountants are, are worth the, the dollars you pay them. Right. Right. So we know- I wouldn't, go, I wouldn't go that far, so, but yes. <laughs> uh, Irfan, you've got a dash, you've got a meeting to chair. Any last word on these? On these? I appreciate the opportunity, David. It's always good to see you, Sean. It's nice to meet you. Um, I am excited that you guys are having this conversation. I think the sector is going to absolutely benefit from the tidal wave of interest and capital coming in, and we got to find ways to uh, to make sure that this sector also benefits. So, thank you. Right. Thanks, Irfan, and Sean. Thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. anything. The last word on this that you might want to point us. In sure. Uh, just to say that you know this is a sector that is emerging in a lot of the ways that it is running. It's operating. The norms, the rules are are still, you know, there's still a lot of, of play with what that looks like. And this is the time for creativity. This is a time for people who can come in, come with new ways to do things, because that's what's going to lay the groundwork for what this looks like 10, 20, 50, 100 years into the future. And uh, if I know a space that has a bunch of creative people in it, this is the one. Great. All right. Well, thank you both. Uh, just an immense wealth of knowledge. Hard to stay out of the weeds on this topic because there are a lot of them. Um, and, and so your help in navigating that's been tremendous. I suspect this won't be the last time both of you are hearing from us in the cultural sector. Thanks. Take care. All right. Thanks, everyone.